Welcome to module 11 of our financial accounting course. This module is all about the statement of cash flows. Now, you may be wondering, like, we have all sorts of assets, we have all sorts of liabilities, we have all sorts of equity accounts. Why is cash so special? You know, it's just a balance sheet account. Why is cash so special that it gets its own financial statement devoted just to it? This is just all about cash. And there's really a couple of reasons. The first is cash is a really important asset. If a company runs out of money, they're dead, right? They can no longer pay their bills. They are bankrupt if you can no longer pay your bills. If you creditor calls for money and you don't have it, you are dead. If you can't pay your employees anymore, you are not going to be in business for long. So it's such an important asset. You know, if a company runs out of uh, inventory, big problem. Uh, but they can buy more inventory. If they run out of cash, they're dead. So uh, it's this life and death kind of an asset. And so investors and outsiders to a company are, of course, very interested in cash. The other reason that the statement of cash flows is very interesting to investors is so many areas in accounting that we've looked at can be manipulated. So my receivables, I can set a higher or lower allowance for doubtful accounts, and therefore I can change my receivables balance and my uh, uh, bad debt expense. I can manipulate that because it's based on an estimate. My depreciation is based on an estimate, and therefore my the value of my long-term assets is based on an estimate. And many of a company's assets are based on estimates, not cash. Cash is thought of, and I think is, a very solid number. When I look at a company's cash balance, I can trust it. And so investors say, look, that number we can trust. So let's look at the transactions sort of flowing around that number. And it's a little bit more trustworthy than what we might see on the income statement or even on the balance sheet. So that's sort of the reason there's a demand for a statement of cash flow. From the producer side, from the accountant side, I always wondered about this as a beginning student because I said, okay, well, cash flow. Obviously, we're going to start with our beginning cash. We're going to say, here's how the cash went up, and here's how the cash went down, and here's what we ended our cash with. Like, that's what I figure, and that's what a statement of cash flow is. Here's what cash we started with. Here's how it's changed. Here's what we ended with. So, okay, I thought that was a reasonable idea of a statement of cash flow. And I thought, well, we already have that. Like, we have this thing called the T account, right? Here's what cash started with. Here's all the deposits to cash. Here's all the withdrawals from cash. And here's the amount of money we had at the end of the year. And truthfully, this does a pretty good job of what a cash flow statement would do. And for most of the companies we've looked at in this course, where you know, if you go back to chapter two and look at the journal entries where we would do a T account for cash at the end, uh, this T account for cash would be sufficient for a cash flow statement. And the reason I say it would be sufficient is because we have all the information we need. You know, I could look at this transaction. I could say, oh, I remember when I debited cash for $100 or whatever the number is. And you could look back to the transaction and figure out what happened. And so you could see the cash flowing in and the cash flowing out. But for any normal company, not even a big company, but for a normal company, a cash T account is going to be unwieldy. And what I mean by that is, like, if I go to a food truck here in Kamloops, right, and I consider their cash flow statement. So the food truck is not a big business. It's a small business. Uh, but a food truck in Kamloops might see 100 customers per day. I think 100 transactions, most of them involving cash, is a reasonable number for a Kamloops-based food truck to do. So if I think 100 transactions, if I'm looking at my T account, I have to do 100 lines. So again, if I do cash, well, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, I'd have to extend this. Let me zoom out here. Oops, I don't know what that's doing there. Zoom out a bit. And it would have to go, and uh, I think it would have to keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. And that would be like, maybe that would get us you know, to why, and that is one day of transactions. That is one day worth of transactions for like a food truck in Kamloops. Walmart Kamloops would be 10 times longer than that. Uh, or a big business in, in this small city would be 10 times longer than that. And so you can quickly see, okay, a cash T account isn't going to do the job because it would be 30 pages long uh, and it would just be like hard to even parse. And so what we've said is, or what sensible standard setters have said is, okay, we have to summarize this 
these transactions that are in this big long T account into something a little bit more reasonable, something that investors can sink their teeth into. And they came up with a, a standard or semi-standard format for a cash flow statement. They said, look, we want you to break your transactions down into three categories. We want you to consider transactions to be either operating, investing, or financing. And all of your cash flows, we want you to classify as either being operating, investing, or financing. Here's the gist of each. Operating is all about the day-to-day -day business of the company. So how is the company generating funds in its day-to-day -day business? So, you know, Walmart, when they sell you stuff, you know, their, their cash inflow from making a sale to a customer is an operating cash flow. Paying their employees to do work, that's an operating cash flow. Paying for operating expenses like the utilities, operating cash flow. These are the day-to-day -day business inflows and outflows of cash are operating activities. Uh, these are kind of summarized by activities that build to give us net income. So typical revenues and expenses, and I'll say operating revenues and expenses. Uh, it's not everything that gives us net income belongs here, but most items that build to give us net income, as well as changes to our current assets and current liabilities. So those are the big three areas we're worried about with our operating. And again, there are exceptions, but that's the gist of it. So when a company buys more inventory, uh, this would be an operating cash flow. When they pay off their uh, accounts payable, it's an operating cash flow. So current assets and current liabilities there. Investing activities are all about the company buying and selling long-term assets. So when I think investing, I think about long-term assets. So if I'm thinking of Walmart, um, they buy uh, like the, the Kamloops Walmart location recently changed and they sell groceries now. And they didn't used to sell groceries like, you know, milk. You can buy milk and cheese at our Walmart. You didn't used to be able to do that. And they installed these big refrigerators. Well, Walmart isn't selling those refrigeration units where they sell their meats and cheeses. They're not selling them to customers. That is a long-term asset they're buying for themselves. That's not their inventory. That's like uh, an improvement to the store. And that is a purchase of a long-term asset, and that would be an investing activity. When they buy the store itself, that's an investing activity. Um, so buying and selling long-term assets like shelves and, and uh, refrigerators and other things like this are long-term uh, assets of Walmart. They are investing activities. Uh, we could also have investments here, like when Facebook bought Instagram, uh, they spent a billion dollars cash, I think. It might have been to stock, but let's say it's cash for our conversation. Well, that would be an investing activity on the cash flow statement. And again, that's a long-term asset. Financing activities. This is where is the company's long-term funding com coming from. Think of long-term liabilities here. Borrowing money from the bank or shareholders' equity, are we getting money from our shareholders? And so under equity, we would also account for dividends, right? If a company pays a cash dividend, that falls under equity, so that falls in the financing section. So the majority of our interest here is actually in the operating section um, because that's where the company's day-to-day -day business. We want to know how a company's day-to-day -day business is doing, uh, but also we can see where the long-term funding is coming from the financing section, and how they're using that long-term funding, the investing section. Now, making your life a little trickier is the fact that the operating section can be done two ways. I don't know if that's a good color. <laughs> we can do it uh, either the direct method or the indirect method. And in my class, we're going to learn to do both. So when you go through problems with me, you're going to learn how to do both methods. Both are accepted under uh, Canadian gap rules. And I think pretty much around the world, uh, the both methods are acceptable. Um, the direct method is preferred by standard setters, but most companies choose the indirect method. And we'll discuss that in uh, as we work through one of the problems. But just know we're going to learn how to prepare the cash flow statement 
uh, operating, investing, and financing section. And when we do the operating section, we're going to do it both ways. No company would ever do it actually both ways. They would just choose one or the other. We're going to do both for every problem we look at. And with that out of the way, I think we should jump in and do some problems now. So in our next video, we'll look at an exa example of a cash flow statement. That's all for this video. I can't wait to get started. Bye for now.